for our Marion Quarter Neighborhood Grant Workshop. And today specifically, we are focusing on um, our HOAs, so our homeowner associations, and and getting into detail about uh, grant projects, the process, and for some of our typical HOA projects, some of the extra steps and processes you guys will go through as part of the grant process. Uh, I'm Shauna Warner and I'm with Neighborhood Services. And just so everyone is aware, we are gonna record this session so we can post it on our website. So if you know of people that couldn't make it today, um, direct them there. We'll also make sure the presentation is uploaded there so you can go back and reference a lot of the details we'll be going through. Uh, so those will be resources for you. And then joining me today, and they'll also introduce themselves when they get to speak, but uh, with Neighborhood Services, we have Laura Kaifas and Elizabeth Thomas on as well um, for Water Conservation, Tina Sleeper. And then we have some of our planning staff, uh, Diana Kaminsky and Dean Miller, uh, who have participated in the grant process over the years and are some of the individuals you'll be talking to if you do have questions. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so Neighborhood Grant Program. What's great about it is it really is um, up to the community, the residents to come together and figure out what your community needs. Uh, you know, what is it that you wanna do to improve your neighborhood? And it gives you the funds and ability to do that. Uh, and it's been around since 1994, the mayor and council very generously dedicate money each year for the program. Um, this year, uh, it's always, always a year ahead of time. The city runs on a fiscal year of July to June. So the grants you're applying for won't be funded until July 2021, but because you have to complete the project in that year, uh, the application cycle starts a little bit earlier. You start it now. Um, and so we anticipate the funding and it's always been there, but the exact amount could always be tweaked because they won't adopt the budget until May and June. Um, but we are looking at around 350,000 to be available. Our water conservation group kicks in additional funds if they meet specific criteria for saving water and, and other criteria that they'll talk about. Um, and this year new, uh, we're looking at a maximum grant of 20,000. Now, specific to our HOAs is you do have to match at least 25% of the requested funds. So who can apply? This program is only open to HOAs as well as our voluntary neighborhood groups and farm food multi-housing um, properties. You do have to register with the city and currently we have 139 HOAs that have done so. Um, and you'll see those uh, reflected in the blue in the map. Um, and then um, part of that that we emphasize, and you'll see this in a few different places, is the grant program should reflect what the community wants. So we do ask that you invite everyone um, into the process um, and get input from the community members on what you might want to do to enhance the community. So it is a capital project, again, benefiting the entire neighborhood, and you have that one year to finish it. So all of the projects need to be completed by June 30th. Uh, for HOAs, you guys have dedicated funding sources for your maintenance project, so it really needs to be something above and beyond. And um, neighborhood staff are always happy to help you with that, but really your grant application should be for enhancements. Project maintenance, um, operation costs are not allowed, as well as um, if you have received a code violation, maybe you don't have all your street trees or whatever it is, the grant can't be used to fix that. It should, again, just be for those enhancements above and beyond what you might normally do. Again, on the involvement piece, uh, we want you to involve the entire community. Um, now, as you guys know, not everyone's gonna show up or participate, but they need to be invited to do so. So um, that'll be part of the grant application that you guys do and in, in submit with the information you're putting in. Um, what do you submit? Uh, and again, this will all be online as well as the application form will be online at tempe.gov slash neighborhood grants. Um, but we will have an application form where we're gonna need to know uh, contact information so we can follow up and, and talk to you about the project, uh, project address. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, you'll describe also just the benefit to the neighborhood in your own words and, and how it might meet the criteria. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into the type of projects we typically see, but something you would submit in that as well as the bids for the grant project, some before after pictures. Uh, we're going to get in great detail about for our, uh, some of our projects that go through 
our planning division, uh, some of the other specific requirements, and then again, that proof that you involved your community. And there are going to be very specific mandatory requirements for your project type. Uh, today, again, we're focusing on what we typically see from HOAs, but we will also have on our website the dates for additional WebExes on project specifics uh, related to parks, traffic calming, or art projects. Um, some of the ones that um, HOAs don't always uh, apply for, but certainly you are welcome to, and we'll have very specific workshops that will get into much more detail on those types. Um, so here, what is evaluated? What are we looking at? Um, quality. You know, what you guys turn in is what those funding decisions are based on. So just make sure you're giving us the information we asked for. Uh, your ability to complete that project and then the impact. Um, are you providing an environmental environmental benefit? Uh, you know, does that improve the health and safety of your community? Are you complementing other projects that may be going on? So really, are you having an impact by using those funds? Oops. And then um, again, you can apply for up to 20,000, but we have seen HOAs coordinate with other associations. And then that gives you the opportunity to access additional funds. So you guys are each eligible for 20,000. If you have a shared park, for example, the, the picture there shows Camelot Park Village uh, Neighborhood Association and Camelot Park Villas Homeowners Association uh, have combined over the years on various improvements to Stroud Park. That's their community space. Um, it's a smaller HOA without their own park. And so they really use that as a community and, and can join in and see some uh, bigger projects and bigger benefit. Um, you'll also see um, a lot of shared streets if it's a public street. Um, and so we've had some traffic calming projects be done as well. Um, you can do art. The one you see there is actually um, done by the Lakes HOA. And so certainly public art is welcome everywhere and anywhere. And again, we'll have a workshop specific to that, but it is something that you guys can be thinking of. You don't have to just do typical projects, but, and we've also have an example there of an HOA that um, put in a community garden and they have the shared um, bounty from that that goes to any of their members. And, and with HOAs that really do have some of those community spaces, Dedicating it to gardening can be uh, great for all of your residents as well. And so kind of more what we want to really focus on today as well and talk about and get questions, because I think we all see from our HOAs that they usually generate the most questions and, and probably some of um, for all of us that don't always go through our uh, front counter for different planning aspects, you know, just questions about exactly how we do this, when we do it, what do they want to see? So we'll be covering uh, that today as well. But a lot of our HOAs are applying for landscape or xeriscape improvements, um, irrigation system upgrades, entry signage, lighting upgrades. Um, and you see pictures here. Um, I should also mention on our website, we do put the successful grant applications. So if you're curious as far as what others have done, how they did it, who they used, all that information is there for you to see. And those can be good resources just to even see what some of these examples we're gonna go through look like in an application form. Um, so what we're gonna talk about and Diana with planning is gonna get into uh, more detail, but when you're doing those typical HOA projects, there's really additional steps besides just turning in that grant application and neighborhood services at the end. And so what she's gonna talk about is what's in the orange and green there, um, but really what they need to see before you really start going out and finalizing everything because what she's gonna show you can make a difference in, in what your final application looks like. Uh, that blue box um, is some of the stuff that I just went through, and then we'll wrap it up at the end, kind of reviewing some of that again. Uh, and then Diana will also briefly talk about what happens after funding. So Diana, it's on to you. Thank you, Shauna. Oh, let me turn my video on here. Okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you for taking time to meet with us. Um, every project, whether it's lighting, landscaping, walls, needs to have a plan. Obviously, we can't um, give you a grant for city money if we don't know what it is that you want to do. So all of the projects have to have a scaled drawing. Um, if it's a landscape plan, we ask that you show existing trees, shrubs, things that are existing to remain. Those are typically shown as dashed circles for existing trees. And that's because there's code requirements for some of these items 
that if you are missing street trees, for instance, we would require you to replace those. Um, and if if you have tr street trees, then you want to take credit for those and and not end up having to put in more trees than you expected in your grant process. And then that's something that's really been a surprise, I think, to some applicants when they go through preliminary site plan review, they may be thinking that they're just removing turf and putting in gravel. And then they find out they actually have to add trees and plants. So it's important to give us as much information as you can about the existing conditions and what you're proposing to do. Um, we need a legend with symbols and we don't ask for a, a full irrigation plan, but certainly showing where the meter is located, where if you have a, a dedicated landscape backflow preventer or whatever for the system, because there are going to be modifications that need to be made for conversion from turf to gravel. If you have existing trees, for instance, you're going to have to put in a deep root irrigation system for those trees to survive um, because they're used to getting water in a different form. Um, labeling property lines, putting the dimensions on those property lines. You can go to the county assessor site and they'll give you some of that information is available for the dimensioning. Um, elevations, if you're doing walls or planters or gates or signs, you would need to have an elevation with dimensions that shows us what you're wanting to do. Lighting projects need to include a light plan that shows on the site where the light fixtures are going, what types of light fixtures and the cut sheets. And I have some examples of that here in a minute. And then in addition to this plan, it's also helpful if you can include an aerial image of the project area. So this could be like from Google map, you just do a satellite image that shows the location so that the reviewers are familiar enough with the site. I think we can move on to the next slide. That slide had a lot of information. <laughs> so changes to landscaping. Your first step now that you've been to this meeting will be to contact community development staff. And Steve Abrahamson is our primary point of contact um, or any of the planners on call. If you call 311, you can also speak with them. But any changes that you do within your community to the common areas must be processed through community development. So this is your first step. And what you need to submit with your application on the scale drawing is show us the existing materials, the proposed materials, the legend and labeling of the of the property lines, right of way and site distances. Also important to show uh, if there's overhead power lines or any utility easements, because sometimes that can affect where you are allowed to plant things. Um, and then for the grant process, you are required to have three bids. And I wanted to point out that planning doesn't review the budget or the bids, but it is important that you provide this early so that if there's changes to your landscape plan, let's say you got three bids to remove turf and put in gravel. And maybe they only specified cubic yardage for one inch of gravel, just a little bit. Well, one of the things we're going to review is how deep is the gravel? Um, have you provided funding for the irrigation system for the trees? Um, what other plants are going to be planted? So you may actually have changes to your grant application that you get notified through preliminary site plan review that in order to meet code requirements, you're going to have to go back to those contractors and ask for revisions to their bid. And that will help you in making sure that when you get your grant um, application submitted, you're really confident that the numbers you're submitting are things that you guys can actually match the funds for as you need and that it's work that is um, can be done in the time frame. So sometimes the projects get scaled back in order to meet the funding available. Um, so that's it on that one. So what must or should the uh, landscape plan have? It needs to have a north arrow. You guys are familiar with where you live, but planners aren't necessarily, and we can look it up online, but it really helps if your plan shows us the orientation of the site, a scale, a legend, which is shown here, the circled area, um, vision triangles at driveways because we have code requirements that when you pull out of the driveways you can look over smaller plants and you're not going to have your vision impeded by um, big bushes right at the street front we also have requirements for the size of the plants adjacent to walkways for safety 
So having all that information helps us give you a good review. The more information you give us, the better comments you'll get back. If you're missing this information, then the type of review comments you're going to get are provide us a plan with a north arrow and a scale and a legend. And that really doesn't help you with revising your bids. You want to get information that's going to help you make sure the contractor has addressed all the code requirements. Zero escaping. Um, I'll let Tina talk a little bit about this, but this is often done as part of a landscape project. Um, it includes incorporation of high efficiency irrigation. It needs to include a vibrant palette of low water use plants. There are some rebates. I'll turn this over to Tina in a minute. And then the turf removal also requires new plants. So what I tell people is zero escape, which is low water use plants, does not mean zero scape with no plants. So please make sure you include green in your in your landscape areas. Um, the turf is 100% coverage with vegetation, which transpires and affects the aesthetics and the um, environment. And if you replace all of that turf with just gravel, you're basically like creating a paved surface that's very hot. So part of our environmental efforts are to replace a percentage of that total turf that's removed with vegetation that helps with that. Tina, did you want to add anything here? Um, I did have a few um, things to discuss just about the water conservation partnership. I don't know if this is the perfect time to do that. And I can address some of the bullets on the screen, Shauna and yes. Diana. What do you guys think? Yes. Yeah. yeah, OK, excellent. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to say, hey, I'm Tina Sleeper from Water Conservation. And basically, this is just one of our amazing partnerships that we do. Um, with my great colleagues, but part of the conservation goal is just to ensure that water is used efficiently and responsibly through effective water saving best practices and targeted outreach. And it's a component of the water resources plan. So there's been some confusion a little bit um, in the past. Water conservation provides additional funds to the total grant budget to help fund applications, as Shauna mentioned at the beginning, um, that are related to conservation, but the maximum grant award per neighborhood is still capped at at 20,000. Um, excellent for having a higher amount this year. And basically our contribution helps fund qualified conservation projects while freeing up additional grant funds in the greater budget for additional neighborhoods, which could include other conservation projects. Um, I appreciated that the, the uh, landscape plan and all of that was discussed first because that is very important that um, these grant applications, whatever the projects are, meet the other departments and meet the neighborhood grant process because it, it just funds approved projects. But projects that would qualify in for water conservation specifically, they have to have a clear connection to a water conservation best management practice as defined by the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Um, past projects that we funded include the Xeriscape conversion, sprinkler head upgrades, smart controller upgrades. We're just here to help with efficiency, help with the plan that you've engaged your neighborhoods in pursuing um, for the good of the entire neighborhood. So whatever option that is, if it's related to a water conservation best management practice, um, I'm happy to meet with, with you to discuss it and provide resources to make sure that it's done using those best practices. Um, the only thing I would say is uh, just addition to this, we everybody has um, the different categories has um, requirements and guidelines and those handouts. I en encourage you to take a look at them under ours. The HOAs and multi housing communities must participate in the HOA water budgeting program, which is simply an educational program that compares recent water usage as compared with an estimated water demand of the common area landscapes, and that's something we can provide. Um, so if, if you're going to uh, maybe get a smart controller or upgrade a sprinkler system, uh, we just ask that you participate in that program. And so feel free to reach out to me. I think I've covered most of the bullet points. Um, let me know if there are other questions. Thank you. Okay, so if you're wanting to upgrade lighting to your property, there are code requirements for um, lighting for safety. 
and also to protect dark skies so that we don't have a, a condition where light is is going in the wrong location and, and lighting up the sky instead of pathways. So you do that preliminary site plan review process, provide us with a site plan that shows um, the location of the lights, the type of lights, the photometric output, which is the amount of, of illumination or light that comes from the light source. And then we do a comparison to the code to make sure it's meeting the code. And we also look at the aesthetics and um, durability as well, so that you're getting a product that's going to last. It's not going to end up having to be replaced down the road. Um, so this is the bullet list of things that you need to include with a, a fixture schedule, um, whether it's hardwired or in this picture, it's showing solar. So for some of the more decorative lighting elements that people may do for landscaping or signage, it may not be required by code. Um, so they decide to do more of a solar application. Um, if it is something that's required for safety or part of the code, then we do require it to have an electrical feed so that we have that connection permanently um, and it doesn't change with a rainy day. But go ahead. So this is an example of the items that you need to include. The lighting plan is, is like a site plan. Um, you're going to show where all the units of the complex are located, the streets, the sidewalks, and then you're going to have some key that shows where the lights are being located. In this case, it looks like they might be building mounted um, and they're showing a cut sheet that shows what the fixture looks like and even the bulb type, because that's what tells us how much light is produced by each fixture. And we wanna make sure that it's dark sky compliant, that it has a shield, that the light's not going to go in the wrong place. And also so that it doesn't create glare. Sometimes putting in lights actually creates a condition in the evening hours where people have trouble seeing and it puts everything in shadows and can actually be more of a safety hazard if it's the wrong fixture. We refer to those as glare bombs. So we're really looking at aesthetics and safety and dark skies and the environment um, for your community. Um, addition to or updates to walls. So changes to your walls must be processed through community development. Um, if you haven't figured that out by now, everything comes through planning for review. Um, the preliminary process allows us to take a look at what it is you're proposing, make sure that it's going to meet codes and whether or not you would need a building permit based on the structural needs of whatever it is you're doing. If it's a repaint, that's different, but sometimes people want to actually modify the walls themselves. So contact us first. When you're doing changes to walls, you're going to provide us with a site plan. Now, a site plan does not have plants on it. So this plan here that you see is more like a, a landscape plan because it has all those little circles on it. That's what you would do for landscape. But the real important part for a site plan is that you show us where the buildings are located, where the streets and sidewalks are located, and where the walls are located. We need to understand what the materials are on the wall and um, the dimensions of that wall in terms of the height and how far away it is from, for instance, the sidewalk. Any lighting changes you'd also include and then provide us with samples of the colors and uh, pictures of the materials for the wall that you're proposing. So this is an example that shows a before picture on the right. Um, and then they wanted to make modifications, basically painting the project. It looks like it was also included with maybe some landscape with a planter. So you want to include all that information so that we can respond to, to that. And when we're, when we're looking at walls, we would also look at plant material to make sure it's not something that would damage the walls in the future. A lot of the projects we see are wall projects where turf and sprinklers have impacted the, the aesthetics of the wall or in some cases the structure of the wall. So we want to make sure whatever plants you put in um, are going to protect the investment that you've made with your community in, in whatever work you're doing on the walls. And I'm going to turn it over to Dean Miller. He is our expert in signage and he take it away, Dean. Thank you, Diana. Um, so I'll be reviewing the, the sign permit applications or sign applications. The thing that is a little different um, for signs is that a sign permit will be required to install the signs. And uh, I wanted to help you um, early on with the, the requirements. 
and kind of get you on the right path for signage so you don't move in a direction of something that may or may not or may not meet code. Um, if your sign is part of an overall project, like Diana um, has already described, you would include it as part of that. Um, but regardless of whether it's an individual project of just signage or if it is um, included with another project, I would recommend that you get in contact with me as soon as possible. And I could look at uh, some preliminary ideas and give you some direction um, to get you going in the right direction. Make sure that it meets code, um, design requirements and such. So um, like Diana spoke of, the uh, more information that you provide, the better information or feedback we can give you. Um, these are some of the basic things that you'll need a site plan like Diana described only will have a location of the sign with dimensions to, to locate the sign on the property. Typically, these are entry signs. They're a lot of times, like in the photo, they're mounted to an existing wall, um, so it's pretty easy. Um, but, you know, where it's located is not going to be an issue um, or a concern as far as measurements too much. Um, but the elevation drawing, the materials, the colors, the dimensions, um, the more that you provide, the more uh, feedback we can give you and get you on the right path. We don't want you getting bids for signage that everybody, you know, everybody's agreed to um, and then get down the line and find out that the sign's too large. It doesn't meet code or, um, or it's not an appropriate material. Um, so those are the things that we're going to look at in a preliminary review to give you some good direction. Um, next one, I think there's another slide. So items to include the elevation site plan, um, cut sheets if there's lighting, uh, especially external lighting, uh, if there's some external fixtures, paint color and material samples. And these are just basic. Um, you're working with the sign contractor, and you know, initially you can do a preliminary, um, just a sketch or whatever, and reach out to me, and I can provide direction. Um, but ultimately, you'd you're going to want some kind of drawings from a sign contractor or uh, a designer um, that could give more specific details on what you're looking for. But the main uh, point I want to get across is if you can reach out to me as early as possible and get direction um, so we can get moving in the right direction, that's the best way that I can help you. Thank you, Thank you Dean. Okay, so your first step is going to be to make an application for preliminary site plan review. We call it SPR for short. And that was one of the, the squares that you saw earlier. I think it was the, the first one was orange and then it went blue and then went green. So this is the orange square um, that Shauna referenced earlier. Um, you're gonna provide this information to us. You make an application um, and then we take about 15 business days to review those and we will mark the plans up and what this does is provides you early feedback from all different departments in the city to make sure that your application has all the components it needs to be um, a good grant submittal when you make your application for, for code requirements. So we have fire, traffic, um, police, transportation, a, a large team of people that will look at these. And then we will identify if there's any processes. We'll be able to let you know if your project needs, for instance, um, permits for construction after you're done with the whole process. This really, the preliminary site plan review saves you time and money because it assures that what you get from your contractors are accurate bids that don't re re reduce your, your project in terms of scope or, or funding or potentially denial or, or delays to your project. So it's really important, but it's also, you need to know it's not an approval. So we are just providing you a courtesy review before you make your submittal for a grant to make sure you're meeting the code. And then you may need to resubmit. If there's information that's missing, you're gonna to wanna to come back through this process again. There's no charge for it. And it's really just to make sure you get the best application in um, for the neighborhood grant as possible. So keeping that 15 day review in mind, um, you're going to want to get with your neighborhood representatives and that involvement process that, that Shauna talked about. 
that starts today. You, you're here with the grant application workshop, which is awesome. And now maybe you have an end of year virtual <laughs> meeting or party that you're doing with your HOA and you want to get notices out to everyone in the community and between December and February, come up with the idea for your project, do the brainstorming and have some type of a sketch plan that you can submit for preliminary site plan review, hopefully in February. I know that doesn't seem like a, a long period of time, but you want to get that early feedback. And then you contact neighborhood services and community development staff to discuss the project, submit your um, application for preliminary site plan review to neighborhood services. They collect them all and then they bring them to planning. And then 15 days after that submittal, um, we will get you comments back. And then you can make the changes to those comments based on the comments you receive and resubmit to neighborhood services for a second review if it's necessary. And then neighborhood services will contact you with the results of the review. So at that point, you'll know we have a report that's written and it will say whether you need to resubmit or whether you're ready to move forward to the grant application process because all of the issues were addressed. Second meeting with neighbors, discuss the progress, make any necessary decisions on how to divvy up the work. So when you get your preliminary comments back, maybe you realize that you took on too large of an area and that, wow, we're going to need to add a lot of trees or we need to add more lights. So you may decide to scale it back or maybe you realize that you could do more. And so you want to go back to the neighbors and discuss the project and where you are with it and what changes might be made and get your bids from the contractors revised as, as you need to after the, the neighborhood meetings um, to prepare your grant application. And that grant application is going to be due um, towards the end of April, the dates are given here, and that is a firm deadline, just like any grant, whether it be state, federal, city, we have to have a deadline and we have to have a cutoff because it takes time to review these. So getting your application in early and, and reviewing it with the preliminary process, hopefully will get you to a really solid submittal by that deadline in April. And we're all working towards that same deadline. So what happens after that um, is in the May, June time period, all the staff from different departments, some of them are the ones that have also done site plan review. I'm usually one of the ones that reviews them as is Dean, is we review all the grant applications and then we make recommendations. So we, we recommend which ones can move forward to council for consideration for a vote. And then the council makes that decision in July and in August, um, neighborhood services gives you written notification of your approval or denial, including a grant ag agreement contract if it's awarded. Um, then you must sign that contract and return it to neighborhood services. And then August and September, there's going to be another workshop. So this is a year, uh, just under a year from now. Um, it'll go by very fast. And you'll be notified of next steps and invited to an online workshop to to discuss the process for how to come back to planning for that final rectangle square that Shauna mentioned with the green one, which is development plan review. So if it is a landscape or, or wall project or lighting project, anything that requires a development plan review, you need to come back to planning, make an application for a grant development plan review. There is no fee for it, but it is an application for an entitlement that gives you permission to actually do the project. And that's what this last rectangle indicates is do not proceed, do not start construction until you have that letter from planning saying that you're good to go. And I'll turn it back over to Shauna. Thank you, Diana. Um, and so again, I know we've thrown out, I think, the word application in multiple ways in different ways, but we are, you know, as an HOA, when you're making any changes to your landscape, your signage, your lighting, you are going to be required for that uh, extra step as we had talked about. So um, this is the same timeline that Diana kind of reviewed with the flow chart, but the idea is you're talking to your neighbors, you know, what do we want to do? How do we want to improve our community? And then um, online, as well as in the background information, everything we share, you'll have direct contact for staff. So we aren't we aren't sending you through someone. You're going to have their direct 
number, their direct email. So reach out, talk to them. Uh, they're familiar with the process. They're going to get information back. Um, and then that's when, um, if you are specific to those kinds of changes and improvements as a nature way, you're going to want to do that preliminary review. And we're here as a resource, so we can walk you through exactly um, what you need to submit. And again, the presentation will be online and we have all those mandatory requirements, but check in with us. You know, that preliminary review doesn't mean you have absolutely everything for the grant done, but just uh, the what's required for those specific types of projects that planning is going to want to see ahead of time. And then it's that April 27th by 5 p.m. And we do mean 5 p.m. Uh, that you are turning in everything and that's everything that our office wants to see for funding in addition to everything that you were had been required from planning because those are you know they build on each other and then those will be reviewed based on the criteria that was shared previously and then the award approval and an actual grant work happens so again um this will be online uh every you know all of that's at tempe.gov neighborhood grants but this is the direct information, um, and then we're all going to hang out here as well for questions. I know you've had some coming in that Laura will help us with, but then um, if you do want to ask a question outside the chat, um, there's a raise hand function. So you can also do that as well, and, and she's happy to direct those questions. So, Laura, I think we're ready for that piece. All righty. So we have a question. Uh, we should, it says we should have the landscape plan done as we're submitting the grant. Yes, would be the answer. <laughs> yes, so we would we would like that plan submitted with the grant. Uh, the whole point of today is really to kind of give you an idea that we'd like to see it even well before that uh, so that you can get some input. And anyone feel free to answer these. I'm not going to be the answer man here on all of them. I and I would say more specifically, or Diana, you go ahead. But yes, the landscape plan has to be done with the preliminary submission as, as well as the grant. Diana, That's what I was going to say. Yeah, the first step is the preliminary site plan. So that landscape plan has to be done fairly early in the process. It may be that that one came in before we went all through it. Uh, okay, another one. Lighting. Should SRP be contacted to come out to the property? Should someone from the city come out first? Diana, you want to take that one or Dean? Sure. We we don't do um, site visits because there's just too many neighborhoods to try to to do that with. I don't know if SRP would or not. Um, there, I don't know if the police department would do like a security survey um, as a courtesy to see where you might have lighting deficiencies. But the first step really would be to do the site plan review process, and then if we saw that there were code deficiencies, we could respond to that, but we're, we probably wouldn't have time to come out and do a site visit. And then to Diana's point, yes, there's uh, with the police department, we have a crime uh, crime prevention unit and they will come out and assess the property and we can make sure and um, follow up with everyone on with those direct contacts. If you don't know, there's an officer for north of Broadway and an officer for south of Broadway in Tempe. And so they will come out and walk the property with you as well and help with that. Okay, I another just wanted part. to add oh. Oh, real quick. I just wanted to add that a photometric plan would help uh, the planners review as well. So if we can get a, a photometric plan to see where what the lighting levels are in each area, um, we could get feedback to you as soon as possible on that as well. Thanks, Dean. Okay, lighting. Also, another question about lighting. How many bids does the grant application require? So, the grant application requires, and this is for all project types, not just lighting, um, but it's going to require three bids. And that's just showing um, now as an HOA, you guys get to decide who you're comfortable with, who you want to do the work. It doesn't mean it has to be three uh, fully executable bids because you will get people who bid and they didn't necessarily give you what you want but it shows you did your due diligence you were checking in um that the amount you're asking for is going to be sufficient to do it um but you don't have to have like three perfect perfect ones the idea is that you've you've shown kind of how much it will cost and that they've bid on the project in a good way Okay, we've got a couple questions that I uh, answered uh, to the person directly, but 
uh, we'll reiterate that the video and all the documents we're talking about will be posted late in the day tomorrow. So the video from this actual meeting uh, and we'll put a PDF of the PowerPoint as well. Um, is the, as well as the, the website will also have Laura all of the all of the other information you're used to seeing. So the grant app, the background, some of the mandatory requirements for the other projects and all that. Correct, correct. Uh, okay, there's another one. Toby, I'm not sure your question here. It says, I have a PowerPoint already developed. Not sure if you wanna expand on that, Toby, I can unmute you. Let me find you here, hang on. And I'll just add while Laura's looking for that um, again, also online, which I think is a great resource is I think for the last maybe five years, four years, we do have the successful grant applications. So again, you can go back and look um, just if you're, if it's your first time applying or you haven't done it before, or you're just kind of seeing, okay, what got turned in and, and looks good to the, and met all the criteria, then those examples are there where you can pull out what all of the materials that were actually submitted. Okay, Toby, I've unmuted you if you want to ask your question live. Maybe Toby's already got his answer. Okay. Going back here. Hang on. Will the video and PDF be posted? Yes, it will. Okay. Preliminary to neighborhood office, not planning department, correct? And yes, that's correct. Right. So yeah, all the materials you wanna just turn into neighborhood services and that helps us be consistent in what uh, gets reviewed, what gets turned in, that we're able to track it and, and we aren't between the two offices missing anyone or any information. And I do wanna just note, um, if you found out about this workshop in a different way than us emailing you directly, make sure you are registered with the office and that you are on our email list. We're gonna be sending up updates, reminders, um, notes to everyone. So if you didn't get kind of that direct invite and wanna be added or contacted, um, let us know. Our website also has that map of registered associations we refer to. So it is possible as an HOA because it's not mandatory. Um, that you aren't registered with our office, but you found out in a different way about the workshop. So just make sure you reach out and we know how to find you and get you all the reminders and updated info as we go along in the process. Okay, we have another question that's regarding a community gathering area where there's a concrete pad um, and they're looking uh, for ideas on what they might do. Uh, the question is how elaborate does the site plan need to be? Well, it, if you think of it as the person who's reviewing it, who is not familiar with the site, you have to provide enough information for us to provide you comments back. So the size of the concrete pad, the area around it, if there's picnic tables or barbecue grills or trees or sidewalks or a ramada, any of that information, you're basically using that drawing as the way that you communicate to us um, what's on site and what you would like to put on site. So you can't assume that we know anything about it, even right down to dimensioning the sidewalk and the, the Ramada, because that's all information that's helpful to us to provide you with feedback. Uh, John, you had a question. I have unmuted uh, you. Right, thank you very much. You can hear me, I take it? Yes, we can. Great, thank you so much. Uh, read some of my questions come from experience as opposed to inexperience. I know that sounds strange, uh, but I go back to the days when, you know, some of these initial steps were through the uh, community planning department, and I'm happy to see that that's now an initial process through neighborhood uh, grant office. That's a, a wonderful change and improvement. Thank you. Uh, but here's uh, the, the question I have, a question I asked about details. Uh, when, when you have a community that's uh, 45 years old, as I think you know, the bills are in the lakes. Uh, a lot of information regarding the development of the community in the first place is hard to access, lost, what have you. 
Um, the reason I asked the question about elaborateness, uh, if we were to hire, for example, a landscape architect to do drawings to scale in order to put in an appropriate concrete pad, in one case there is already a pad, a charcoal grill, commercial quality, a picnic table, commercial quality on those pads, and a sidewalk connecting the pad to the existing sidewalk so that it's uh, ADA compliant. Uh, if we had to get professional drawings, we'd be investing thousands of dollars in this very initial step. So as long as we're complete enough so that you have a basic understanding of what's being proposed, is it necessary to go so elaborate as to hire professionals to come in and provide uh, professional schematics for you? Am I making sense? Yes, I understand. For any landscape project or, or a small site plan project like what you're referring to, we do not require stamped and signed drawings from a professional. Um, you can sometimes use an aerial and trace over the buildings and the key features and then use that for your first sketch. Um, as long as you can provide us some dimensions, you can hand write it in. It doesn't have to be a CAD drawing. At some point when you're getting bids, sometimes the, the contractors that you're bidding with will offer services to provide a drawing that's right. of a higher right. quality. But it's really, you can you can do it yourself. Um, and, you know, trace paper over a, an aerial or whatever. And is, the key is to make sure you have the dimensions and the other things that are on that checklist right, right, right. so that we can give right. you comments. Right, which we certainly which we certainly would include. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, just two more questions. Sorry to take so much of your time. Real uh, quick, John, before you ask your next question, I just appreciate you mentioning making it accessible. Um, I will note that we won't fund projects that aren't accessible to everyone. So that first step really should be making sure that someone can access right, the improvement. Right. So thank you. I just want to highlight that. You said it, but okay. so everyone else hears okay. it. Go ahead. All right, fine. Now, one person's name you did not give us in terms of who might we might consult with in making sure we're doing this uh, correctly uh, is is not in is actually outside of your immediate area and consultant consulting people, but would be helpful to us because I did deal with him several years ago when we were thinking about pads and charcoal grills and picnic tables. And he's the person who's in your uh, parks area, I think, and relates to grants mm -hmm. that relate to public uh, or to city parks because he had all the specifications for those things at, when they're installed in in public parks. And those specifications would be useful to us because I know those meet code, uh, ADA compliant, and so on. And is it Absolutely, possible? yeah. Who so would someone, that be? That's Dave McClure, and we'll okay. have at at temp.gov slash neighborhood grants. We have additional staff, so not just parks, but we have our transportation, our art staff, all okay, their staff good. members. Yeah. So today we were just highlighting some of these ones, but all right, of that's, that's online. Yeah, and and including that kind of info. Okay, one, I'm sorry to hold you up. One last question. Oh, um, and it only occurred to me after the, course, looking at the various possibilities here that the community might be supportive of. Uh, one last one. I happened to notice when you were looking at um, some examples of uh, improvements that were made to walls and so forth, not that we have that in mind. Uh, some of it included uh, aesthetic, making walls of more aesthetic through addition, addition of uh, paint of various kinds. I, the reason I'm raising that question is I always saw painting as a maintenance thing, and I know your grant doesn't pay for that, but our buildings on our community are what I call Southwest boring. Uh, when everything got painted sand colored, we have talked as a board and as a community to some extent about are there areas of the buildings that could be highlighted to provide a contrasting color? So the issue is not maintenance, the issue is aesthetics. Does that fall within your guidelines? Yeah, you know, with HOAs, it's always a little tricky because, yeah, it isn't just, oh, I needed a new coat of paint. And so, honestly, John, part of that is is the story you tell in your grant application and that you're showing that it is an enhancement. Um, okay. The one thing, but I will tell you, we had a, HOAs that have had wall, wall improvements funded, and it was adding what you just said, brick elements, um, adding, you know, some kind of something to make it not just the one massing of wall right so it wasn't necessarily 
painting, but it was, yeah, what you're kind of talking about is how do we add elements that still add to some aesthetic without just a basic paint. And that's where, honestly, um, when we review the grants, the staff go out, we take a look at the sites, and, and it can be pretty telling when you're out there whether it truly is, wow, they haven't painted in 20 years or it's it looks great, but now they're adding elements that help with the aesthetics. Okay. And that okay. includes all the project signage, all the other pieces okay. that an, an HOA might do. Okay, I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you for answering my questions. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else? Linda, you have a question? Let me unmute you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, what, what is ahead. the match? I must have missed the, we're at the very beginning of the conversation. I might have missed. What's the match amount this okay. year? So it's still going to be the same. It's 25%. So it's going to depend on um, the amount you ask for. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with questions? Anne, I see you have one. Hang on. Hello. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, well, first of all, I guess, was there two separate meetings, one for neighborhood associations and one for HOAs? Because this one, I guess I... Yeah. I guess I missed the one that was neighborhood associations. Maybe no, you didn't miss anything. And we just haven't held those yet. Those are going to be specific to the project type. So we'll be doing one for parks, oh, oh. one for arts, et cetera. Oh, they, so you, the first one's this Friday, and then it continues through next week. And those are for neighborhood and HOAs. Yeah. Well, you guys have a general meeting for everybody. Yep. But the, you're only doing a, a general meeting for HOAs this year. Correct. Oh, okay, and and then the other questions were okay. So we're looking at a couple different things, but in one we were looking at last year was doing a little bit of work uh, up by Curry Elementary on Country Club Way, not part of the Country Club Way project, you know, kind of thing. But anyways, that would involve you know maybe traffic circle or bump out kind of things, and um, those particular. <laughs> What I was wondering is about irrigation. Um, so, is it required to put irrigation on those? Because you know it's not really practical. So, the, the alternative is to use landscape that's very low water use. That can and and possibly I've seen in past grants that they had water trucks come out. They funded water trucks to come out for like a year, and so. You know, they to get the plants established enough that they can survive without the irrigation. So, is that an acceptable? I mean, how would you present it on your site plan, or would they deny it because you don't have irrigation? Because, you know, when I looked at another project, they wanted me to tap the line, separate line, even though the city actually already had an irrigation line there. You know, <laughs> or that's kind of what they were talking about. Even they they didn't. Uh, the, the city didn't want to pay the small amount for for watering if we use their existing one was one of the problems. So kind of a lot of questions in that one. Sure. So and for any grant project, if it's going to be on on the city property, the city has to agree to it as well as to any maintenance. So that would include not just water, but if you're improving a park, then they're going to keep that park um bench or sidewalk or whatever it is maintained for the life of that um piece so yeah the city has to agree and then we will have a specific grant workshop on traffic calming this friday that'll have our uh, transportation staff but then diana i don't know if you guys want to address any kind of landscape and city right of way or if you sure i can i can provide an answer based on experience with yeah, well, past grants there's something in the back of the can we mute yeah, i'm trying to find who's it's a smart thing to do okay okay thank you so what I would suggest is that you provide us with your landscape plan as part of your traffic calming, if it's like a roundabout with the proposed plants so that we can take a look at that. Obviously, we would also be working with the traffic engineering staff and um, Tina with water conservation to look at the species of plants. It's not just a matter of not having water to them. Um, 
because you actually have to design the curbing differently to allow water from the street to run into that area. It's called low impact design and it works in some areas, but does not work in all areas because it affects the topography of the street itself. And the city may not in the future may not commit to staffing a water truck coming by for a year to water plants. If you look at what happened this summer with the heat that we had, a lot of low water use plants didn't make it through the summer because it was just too hot and there wasn't enough water. We didn't get our monsoon. So we have to look at each site individually and see whether what's being proposed um, will survive because if it doesn't survive, as, as Shauna mentioned, it's in the city's uh, right of way and then it becomes a maintenance issue for us. Um, we would also look at the appropriateness of the plant to the area. If it's adjacent to a sidewalk and you're proposing agave and cactus, that may not be something we can support because that's a hazard to people who are on the sidewalk. So some of the plants that might be the lowest water using um, may not be appropriate for that area. So we, we would look at it on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, there was an additional question about what is a photometric plan and how do we get that? That is a good question, and I don't know if there was one in your earlier part of the PowerPoint that showed it, but what it shows is a site plan with a bunch of little numbers on it, and those are foot candle measurements taken from each fixture. So when a fixture is shown to produce a foot candle is imagine a standard candle. I'll put my video on because that might be the easier way to explain this. Okay, a foot candle is imagine a, a 12 inch candle and it's lit. And it's the amount of light that's produced 12 inches away from the flame. It's a very old form of measurement, but what they do is with light fixtures, they take the foot candles, the number of, of lumens that occur a distance from that fixture, and they put that on the plan as a measurement. And so usually whoever is providing the light fixtures can provide you with that photometric plan. Um, so you would have to work with a, a engineering company that was doing the light fixtures for the community, maybe a contractor that does the install, and they would be able to provide the fixture cut sheet and then a, a basic plan that shows those foot candles from each fixture in order for us to review it for code, code conformance. So, for instance, gates, like a pedestrian gate, has to have five foot candles. Walkways need to have a half of a foot candle. Um, Pool areas about a foot candle, parking areas, two foot candles, and it has to do with how much light you need to see for your personal safety. So that's the importance of that plan. Okay, thank you everyone. We wanna be mindful of your time. Um, so we are gonna wrap up, but again, um, the website is there. We've updated it um, for each of the projects. They have their own sheet. So Tina had mentioned water conservation, for example, and there's one for parks and trees and as well as what we talked a lot about today, the landscaping, the signage, the lighting. And, and so all of that is online and that would be there in addition to this presentation and the recording. Um, and then just reach out. So if there are questions we weren't able to get to, or if you didn't get to ask what you wanted to, um, our direct information is there as well. So we do encourage questions often. We're happy we're here to help. Um, what we don't wanna happen is April 27th, you turn something in and, and no one has seen it. So we want all the grants to be successful. We love the community improvements you guys are so creative in coming up with. So reach out, uh, we're here to help you and um, good luck on the grant application process. Thank you. <laughs> trying to end it here. It's not letting me. Okay. Goodbye, all. <laughs>